Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm Associate Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. Hey everybody, I'm Danielle. I'm from Fine Gardening Magazine too. You know that by now. You know Carol, you know me. We're like old friends. We sit with you in the car. We keep you company in traffic. Did you just wake up and have a cup of coffee like us? Welcome. Let's get some donuts next time. So today we are, we were just joking around actually with our producer, Carrie, because we told her the topic and she started laughing. And I said, yeah, we're, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel on this one. But Carol, you said, oh no, oh no, this is not a bottom of the barrel topic, is it? You are going to love it. Sensational seed heads. Yes. Seed heads. You know, I feel like it's that attribute and trait you know, we talk about color, we talk about habit, we talk about texture, we talk about blossoms, we don't talk about seed heads, you know, what a lot of us are left with at the end of the season and to get us through winter, we rely on seed heads. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And, and birds and other mm -hmm. little animals also love the seed heads. So I don't I don't think seed heads are bad. I think seed heads are fun. All right, I like it. And you know, I'm I'm going to I'm going to throw in some crafting tips for seed heads. You know, we're we're going to go all Martha Stewart on you guys today. So, buckle up, baby. All right, Carol, give me your first amazing seed head and the plant which we relate it to. Okay. So I'm going to start out with an annual, at least for us, it's an annual. It is Strawberry Fields Gomfrina. Mm. So Gomfrina Hygiene, I think is how you <laughs> pronounce that, Hygiene. Uh, hey. And it is hardy from zones 9 to 11, and <laughs> it's a small one. It gets 1 to 3 feet tall, 12 to 18 inches wide. It loves full sun. So this is a nice little front of the border filler and it has strappy silvery leaves and then the seed heads slash flowers it's not really the flowers and i'll get into that in a bit they are bright red they look like little strawberries and that bright red color is not actually the flowers those are bracts and the flowers are quite insignificant uh little yellow trumpety flowers you can see them if you get up really close from a distance it looks like the yellow seeds on the strawberry and mm -hmm. they have that same kind of shape um from sort of midsummer all the way up until frost it covers itself in these little bracty flowery bunches nice. and then they ripen right in place and that's the seed head and I've discovered that the birds and little uh, rodenty creatures that <laughs> live around my garden love them and will, as soon as they start to ripen, they will start picking away and getting delicious seeds out of these heads. Um, but there's usually plenty. And if you want to dry them, there's a little Martha moment here. If you like to dry <laughs> them, you want to cut them before frost and hang them upside down and it does have a pretty sturdy stem but that helps the the stem to dry straight and then you can decorate with the with them you know all year i do recommend stripping off the leaves because they do not look good dried so you just want the little uh flowery bracty things and no leaves on the stems um nice. yeah, so that those are those that's my first sensational seed head plant I know, Carol, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that you have brought some of the Strawberry Fields Gumfrina into the office and, you know, you used to decorate your cube a little bit or our, you know, our administrative assistance desk. It maintains that color too, right? That kind of reddish color. Because I seem to remember them being dried and really still holding on some intense color. Or did you spray those? No, you re they really do hold the color well. But like I said, you have to cut them before the frost because like the day after the frost, that color starts to fade. And the, okay. the part of the stem that's a little bit newer will droop so that little head will droop down. But if you cut it while it's in full color, it will hold that color like a year, you know. Oh, wow. That's cool. 
Um, I also discovered the, the mice that get into my basement and I had these hanging in the basement. They would pull them over from like the little perch that they were on and eat them. And I, I found that, you know, a little spot where the mouse was going like, oh, thank goodness she saved some of these for me. <laughs> <laughs> she laid me out a Thanksgiving dinner right here in the basement. How nice of you. <laughs> I don't I want to talk it. about what happens to some mice to get into the basement. Of <laughs> That's an entirely different episode. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a different podcast, too. Yeah, not this one. <laughs> so I felt like we couldn't do a seed heads episode without an allium. Because in my humble opinion, I think that might be the queen of the seed heads or the, the king and queen of the seed heads in the garden. And I feel like most people gravitate when they talk about the most impressive Allium seed head is that uh, Star of Persia, which is Allium Christophi, which is huge. I mean, you know, head size seed head of this crazy globe like, you know, really intense star shaped seed head. But I'm not going to talk about that one because I feel like everybody expects that. And instead, I'm going to talk about Purple Sensation Allium, which is zones three to nine. Now, this is a bulb that um, it's probably a little late in the season for most of the listeners to get these in the ground. But maybe some of you still haven't, you know, your ground hasn't frozen still. Plant it in fall. This is an allium bulb that you want to plant in fall. It gets two to two and a half feet tall and then maybe a foot wide. I mean, it's really about the height and not so much the, the girth of the foliage with alliums. Um, much like many of the other alliums, it puts on this green strappy foliage. Um, and you want to make sure that you're surrounding this with some sort of bare leg coverage because as the stem starts to shoot up from the middle of that grassy like foliage of the allium the foliage starts to yellow out and kind of decline and that's you know that's signaling the end of the foliage show and the beginning of the flower show but it can kind of look unsightly so i around most of my purple sensation i have um sedges you know evergreen sedges and that really just kind of hides those that ugly bare leg of the allium so this the stem shoots up about two feet tall and then purple sensation i would say has the densest baseball shape and size purple flower it is a true drumstick like allium um and it's very very intense violet you see it from a distance they look really really cool it's you know just kind of this purple firework hanging out in the garden and i just let them go you know they they hold the color for about a week and a half to two weeks it's not that long but it really doesn't matter because then it turns and fades to kind of a light pink and then it goes to an all taupe color and at the ends of each of those like the the baseball is a baseball and then it's got these little filaments that kind of connect to the center like I don't know Star Wars like the Death Star that sort of thing and then on the ends of those are little itty bitty like stars so you know that's where all the the actual flowers are and the seeds pop open and they're black and I wish they self-seeded they do not in my garden but it holds that shape because purple sensation is so dense and I mean we record early, but it's November. I'm looking outside and I still have those purple sensation alliums hanging out in my garden. They look beautiful through fall. They look absolutely beautiful into winter when the, you know, the snow kind of collects on them. And unlike Christophi, you know, allium Christophi, they don't break apart into tumbleweeds because they're really really dense and it's my favorite seed head to use in crafting projects. We've got a um I'll drop the link in the show notes, but a couple of years ago, I made a, a winter solstice wreath out of allium, these, these purple sensation allium seed heads. I gave them a light spray of white spray paint. Here's your Martha moment. And um, I made a wreath out of them because when you spray paint them slightly white, they look like snowflakes. I mean, these are really, really interesting snowflakes. So um, if you've got full sun, you've got well-drained soil, and, you know, you've got some time to pop in some allium bulbs, I highly recommend Purple Sensation as 
the best seed head, I think, of the allium family. So, Carol, do you have any, I know you grow alliums. Do you have any that you particularly love for the seed heads? Or are you more, you grow them for their, you know, presence and bloom and kind of habit foliage-wise? I, I, I have Summer Beauty, which does okay. beautiful seed heads. Um, and I actually have some of those hanging up in the basement right now. I don't know nice. what I'm going to do with them. And I have Nodding Allium, Allium uh, Cernium, I think. Okay. That's yeah. the native one. And that one, mm, it's it's cute in the garden, but I don't really do the, anything with those seed heads. Not as much. I feel like the, the Summer Beauty Allium is almost like the purple sensation, but the mini version. It's also got a really dense seed head to it so there we go we gave everybody a bonus plant i'm sorry i sidelined you what was the real plant you wanted to talk about next ah my so my next plant okay it's a vine how about oh, that yeah. and this is a vine you will you will re maybe remember this this was in the old test garden before we moved to our new location uh clematis tibet tibetana i think it's a uh, oh. The name refers to Tibet, which is part of its native range. And no one really seems to give it a common name, but Tibetan clematis might work because, you know, that's sort of like the literal tr translation of its botanical name. Um, it's pretty hardy. It's hardy from zone six to nine, but I would have maybe expected a little bit colder hardiness given that its, its native range is the Himalayas in India, oh, wow. Nepal, China, and Tibet. And in nature, it grows on slopes and grassy areas and gravelly riverbeds. So that gives you sort of a sense of what its conditions it likes. It likes moist, well-drained soil and full sun. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in nature, I think it clambers onto other plants. It uses um, sort of modified seed or leaf stalks to wrap okay. around the stems of other plants or itself. At the test garden, it was growing up the deer fence. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it gets pretty big, 12 to 14 feet tall and wide. And so um, it is a vigorous climber and uh, it, it will latch onto trellising or whatever, as long as it, there's something for it to wrap, up, wrap around. Um, this is in the buttercup family, so that may give you an idea of what the flowers look like. Uh, the, it has the finely cut clematis foliage, and then the flowers are like buttercup yellow. And they are usually downward facing with a center that looks kind of fringe, fringy like a buttercup and look, these sort of elegant pointed petals, and there are four petals on each flower. Um, and then those flowers are followed by silky, tassely seed heads. And that's oh, what you'll see. Beautiful. I actually have photos in the show notes of the flower and then the seed heads. Oh, um, nice. But they remind me, um, like, from the Lorax, the Trufula trees. Oh, right? yeah, like, like a bit of smoke, like a puff of smoke. Yeah, feathery or, yeah, like, you know, some kind of Muppet, like maybe... <laughs> Senior Muppet because they're silver, right? They're not. They're not a color. Um, the flowers on this one are are produced on the current season's growth, so you would prune this one in spring. Um, this one sadly did not make the move from the test garden. Uh, a staff member who is not not a current or former host on this podcast <laughs> um, cut right through the tap root. And I saw it happen, and I saw that person go, oh, that'll work, and jam it into a pot of soil. And I was like, oh, no way that is going to work. <laughs> and it did, oh. I did not make it. Um, oh, gosh. I must have totally blocked that out as, like, a traumatic thing, you know, like, because I don't remember that at all. <laughs> there were many good plants that made the move. This just wasn't on the list. It wasn't in the mm -hmm. cards. I wish I had have taken cuttings or something because – I don't think it's an easy plant to move. That taproot looked huge. It would yeah. have been hard to get all of it. So I think the better way would have been with cuttings. But anyway, uh, maybe someday, maybe someday I will find this plant again because I thought it was very beautiful. It was, and it was a delicate clematis too. It wasn't, um, you know, don't think the, like the big hybrid versions that have, you know, that have those big, huge, Sorry, I think some of them are gaudy looking flowers. It was far more delicate, even in its 
habit and its foliage, you know, smaller leaves, wiry stems, just a really, really refined look about it. Um, and I forgot about those seed heads. That was really cool. And gosh, yellow. I mean, a yellow flowering vine. That's that's not something you see every day. That's a that's little bit great. rare for a color. Okay, so this is my my next plant is something that I didn't really realize until we were charged with doing this episode topic. I didn't really realize how cool these uh, seed pods were on it. Um, I grow a couple of different Ito peonies, the intersectional hybrid peonies. So um, the one that I'm randomly going to mention is Copper Kettle just because I love the blossom color on it. But um, Ito peonies, everybody knows it's an intersectional hybrid between a tree peony and an herbaceous peony. So it's kind of a sturdy, bulky peony with really large flowers. And Copper Kettle is a pinkish kind of orange flower that combine it together, look from a distance, it has a copper color to the flower. Um, Ito peonies are tough. Uh, zones three to eight, I really genuinely feel like there's not much you can do to them to screw them up or not be able to grow them. They're super, super hardy. But this past fall, I kind of noticed, knowing that this episode was coming up, that they get this amazing starfish-like tan seed pod to them. Um, half dollar size. I mean, pretty, pretty chunky. And I, I never knew. I mean, I don't know why I never knew. I knew my herbaceous peonies got, you know, kind of a smaller seed pod to them. And, you know, the birds were on them a little bit. But wow, that Ito peony really delivered, which I guess makes sense because the blossoms are ginormous. They're softball or bigger sized. I mean, they're really, really chunky, but my goodness, I've just loved watching those stars now just kind of float on very, very sturdy stems. I went out, I, I cut down the stems because you were going to want to do that anyway for peonies. Um, peonies suffer from a disease that, that can be found when you let the foliage really decompose and stay on the crown of the plant. So you want to, you know, that if you're a lazy gardener like me and you let a lot of plants go until spring and you don't cut them back, this is one that you definitely, any peonies, you definitely want to clear away that foliage, that spent foliage. So when I did that, I, I cut the seed pods off and, you know, here's the Martha moment. I was feeling a little crafty and just a very slight gold spray on those seed pods. And they look like little golden stars. And I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I'm going to do something holiday related, maybe put them on, you know, packages that are wrapped up as, you know, a little bow, an alternative to a bow or something along those lines. But I really, really was surprised and, and pleasantly surprised by the seed pods on the Ito peony. Um, if you're looking, you know, for conditions for Itos, they're full sun. Um, they'll take a, a little bit of shade, some partial shade, more so than the herbaceous peonies. And they like moist, well-drained soil. They're very well behaved, two to three feet tall and wide. This is no shrinking violet. This is not going to be a teeny tiny plant. You're going to want to put this into the middle of your bed um, to give it some space. But um, yeah, so give it a whirl. I, I I was shocked. I sometimes your garden surprises you, and you go, "How did I never notice this before?" Have you noticed it's peony seed heads before, Carol? I don't think so, but I do need to go clean up my peony because that that's something I have not done yet. So thank you for the reminder, and I'll look <laughs> for seed heads. Maybe they're out there, and I just haven't noticed. There you go. All right, here you heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right. See, who knew seed heads could be this fascinating, Carol? <laughs> Which right? is fascinating. My next one is a ground cover. I just, yeah, I loved how this made me think because I was literally walking around the garden going, okay, all right, who has good seed heads here? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where I came across this one. Um, this is sedum, oh goodness, Camp Cacium, I think. Camp Kochka Sedum. 
And it is uh, named for the, a region in Siberia on the Pacific coast of Siberia. Did you know Siberia had a Pacific coast? I did not. I don't think so. I just know, <laughs> like, if you're mad at somebody, you like, go, oh, I'm going to send you to Siberia. You know, it doesn't sound like a good place to go. But if it's got a coast, maybe it's right. not all that bad. All right, so this this little seed of likes it there, I guess. It grows um, on the Kamkachka Peninsula of Siberia. It grows in northern China. Some sources say northern Japan. Not all sources say that one. Um, but it gives you a sense. It's like, you know, sort of a northern climate plant. And it is hardy from zones 3 to 8. So, you know, Vermonters and upper Midwest people that nothing will, you know, none of these plants you talk about will grow here. This one will. Yeah. Um, and it's cute. It's a, it's a nice little ground cover. It's a low creeping evergreen perennial. Um, although the foliage tends to be evergreen more at the tips, the growing tips and the lower foliage will tend to uh, turn color and drop off in the fall and then come mm -hmm. back again in the spring. Um, but it's a nice, you know, useful green color. It does, you know, it does spread quite nicely, but not aggressively. And the flowers are these pretty little yellow star shaped flowers that are mm -hmm. on there, I would say most of the summer, right up until frost. And um, following the flowers, tiny, tiny little star shaped uh, seed heads. And as far as I can tell, this is not a self seeder. It really spreads more vegetatively by creeping. Um, but this is where the seeds I think would be produced. And these are held all winter long. And they're, they turn this nice sort of mahogany brown color and maybe a little silvery as they age. And they look super cute, just like sticking up out of the snow or, you know, it's just a little interest at ground level during the winter time. So that's, you know, I don't know. I, I, I was like, I no, I think that's the seed head. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's interesting too, because we always think of like, you know, the seed heads that make, you know, they make the pages of fine gardening or ones that stick up, you know, two feet out tall from the, you know, the shrubs and, and, and whatnot. But yeah, it's important because I mean, Lord knows we're getting less and less snow cover lately. So, I mean, it's important to have a little bit of interest down at ground level too. You know, we're not always, a lot of us aren't always buried in snow all winter long. And that's just a nice little, a little thing. I will say this sedum when it's, you know, alive and kicking in the summer reminds me of like an underwater plant. It looks like it's an aquatic, you know, sea anemone or something. To me, that's what it looks like. And I think it's so cool to see the variation in that that genus because it certainly doesn't look anything like it's related to sea to modem joy, no matter what, to me. That, that, that is for sure. Yeah, this is one of these, you know, the more... the. The creeping ones, um, yeah. and the, I love that I didn't describe the leaf, but it's this. Uh, it's, I think they call it spade eight, but a little flattened leaf with scalloped edges, almost like a holly kind of, you know, little points on it, um, and narrow at the base where it attaches. Um, so it's just a cute leaf shape too. Super cool little plant, super, and clearly very tough too, which we could all use more tough plants in yes. our gardens. It, it likes Siberia. <laughs> Yeah, I know. There you go. That's its selling point. <laughs> if you could give it any conditions slightly better than Siberia, you're in. Um, okay, so I'm going to go with a standard, uh, Baptisia. So Baptisia australis, zones three to nine. Got a North American native coming up here and such a great plant just overall. I mean, this is a full sun plant. It likes well-drained, lean soil, thrives in spots where a lot of other plants won't. Um, gets three to four feet tall and wide. Um, I'm going to start off with saying that basically any Baptisia is going to give you cool seeds, um, but I'm just going to go with the straight um, species right now. It has beautiful glaucous pea-like foliage during the spring and summer, a very, very dense, you would think it's a shrub and not an herbaceous perennial from a distance, 
in mid to late spring, depending on where you live in the country, it's going to send up these flower spikes that are candles of tiny, again, pea-like flowers that cover the stems in these long wands, these candle-like wands. Australis, uh, the species Australis are uh, bright lavendery blue, um, maybe with a little bit of white around the edge um, if you get really up close to it. But this is a tough plant. Um, uh, it was one of the first plants I planted in my garden. It's still kicking. It's not resentful. It doesn't require any sort of extra care. It's extremely drought tolerant. And that's because it's got this massive, we were talking about tap roots earlier with your, <laughs> you had the air clematis, but the tap root on a baptisia is very impressive. Um, so that's why it's so drought tolerant. But then, you know, the flowers fade away and it, you'll notice on those those wands of, of uh, flowers that they kind of mature almost into like this green bead like structure. And then I don't know when it happens. To be perfectly honest, I need a time lapse camera on my baptisia to know how this all occurs. But at some point in time, it forms this pod that looks like a green pea. And that's really cool. And then those green peas, typically when we start to get a couple of really good cold weather spates, it turns black, totally black. Now that might not sound attractive, but it looks so stinking cool. It is a very cool seed head or a seed pod. And those pods are all up and down that, that wand of what was prior to, you know, the, the blossoms going away. It's on that wand of flowers. Um, it makes really cool Halloween decor because you got these black seed pods and you shove them into your containers and it just looks super cool on the plant. They stand strong. They're really, really hardy stems. And inside are peas or pea-like seeds. And when the wind blows through them, these things rattle. I mean, and rattle really loudly too. Almost like you think there might be a rattlesnake that's moved into your garden. And I learned from the research that these were actually used as children's toys, as children's rattles in the early 1900s. Now, listen. Please do not give these seed pods to your infant children. If you're listening to this podcast, I do not recommend that. A lot of the things that we did in the 1900s, we do not do now. So please don't do that. But it is a very cool seed pod that I just, I genuinely love. Um, and I have a bunch of different cultivars of Baptisia and all of them have varying degrees of these black pea-like seed pods. Um, but the Australis, tends to be the biggest and the boldest in my humble opinion. I think you have this plant and we have talked about these seed pods perhaps before, Carol, have we not? I think probably, maybe, maybe we have talked about them, but yeah, I have, uh, I think six or seven different baptisias and, um, you know, Australis hasn't bloomed for me yet, though, so uh -huh. I, I don't think that's the seed pods I would have been talking about. I have one that's called Small Yellow uh, Baptisia, and I, I cannot remember the Latin name, but um, it's the, the seed pods are so small, but, you know, just like miniature versions, so that that's fun. Like little black peas on it. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Carol, I'm very impressed with us. We have made an episode about seed pods. Extremely interesting, in my humble opinion, thus far. So bring it on home. What's your last seed pod must have? Okay, so my last one is called Blue Glow Globe Thistle. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. Echinops Banaticus Blue Glow. And that's one, that is another really hardy one. Hardy from zones three to eight. It gets four feet tall, two feet wide. And don't worry, anybody that has like PTSD from dealing with thistles in your garden, oh my goodness, it is not a real thistle. So that's good news. Um, but it does have thistle like foliage. And so it's got that sort of, um, you know, like the, the thistle shape rosette um, with white on the back sides of the leaves. And then it sends up these long, sturdy stalks well above the foliage and it has 
electric blue almost like the good it's indigo but it's got this zap of silver in it uh mm -hmm. rounded seed head like a disco ball kind of with a little blue in it i guess um and it's the, it's the you know flowers are born on that and it's a compound flower bees of course go just wild for it a lot of pollinators butterflies like it um it's it's rather prickly though so nothing eats the flower and nice. uh the deer and the rabbits seem to leave the foliage alone as well so it's rather resistant to those little chompy animals that we have to worry about so much and those striking globe-shaped flowers turn into the seed head like a silvery seed head at the end of the season and what i must admit is that i could not get a photo of the seed head after it had gone, you know, gone to seed because the little goldfinches and other birds swoop right in. And so all I've got out there now are partial seed heads. But um, I just love the idea that this is food for the birds. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's it's really does have a long season of interest. But if you're gonna leave it standing, just don't expect the seed has to be perfect because they are evidently delicious to birds. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And a very cool, like that is a very unique color in the garden, that silvery blue. I, I think you described it perfectly, a blue disco ball. That's perfect. Um, and see the cultivar again of this one. So this one that I have is called Blue Glow. There are several oh, cultivars yeah. and they all kind of look similar. Um, and this the botanical name Echinops banaticus. Banaticus. All right. Okay. And we're, we're, we're zonally wise, we're looking at it was three to eight. Three so, to eight. All right. You are just, you're making those Vermont gardeners very happy today. <laughs> yes. That's it. That sounds like a tough tough plant too. All right, uh, I'm going for another classic favorite. You know, this is one of the ones where I, I just feel like we couldn't do a Sensational Seed Heads podcast without talking about Gold Shrimp Black Eyed Susan. You know, that's Rebecca, Bulgida, Variety, Sylvantii, Goldstrom. Um, zones three to nine, Man, zone three, we're your best friends this episode. We really are. Um, it's a tough, tough plant. Everybody knows it. Two to two and a half feet tall and wide. Full sun, well-drained soil, lean soil. Do you have soil that's basically gravel? Great. This is the plant for you. It will grow for you and it won't be tough at all to keep alive. Um, it's a classic for a reason. You get this really kind of dense uh, foliage down at the base. The leaves are spade-like. They're dark, dark green. They're covered with a little bit of fuzz to them. Um, my speculation is because there's that fuzz and it's kind of a stiff leaf to it that the deer tend to leave it alone. I, I don't notice a lot of munching on my on my uh, on my black-eyed Susans, but. Beware, because when it shoots up those flower stalks and the buds start to come on, which are those golden daisies with the dark eye in the middle of it, I do see occasional browsing from the deer. It's like they come through, it looks like they bite a few off, they realize it's fuzzy, it gives them indigestion, and then they move on to my hostas or something. I, I don't know what happens, but that's my speculation. Um, so those golden daisies, those come in mid to late summer, the petals fall away, and what you're left with is that dark black eye of the of the seeds. And around the outside kind of has these little spiky collars around it. I think we've all pretty much seen those seed heads, but what brings me the greatest joy is you mentioned the goldfinches. Goldfinches flock to the seed pods of the Goldstrom Black-Eyed Susan like nobody's business. And they kind of hold on to the stem on the side. So they're kind of like sidewinding. And then they start to like eat and pack away at the seeds. And they're, you know, they're kind of hanging on for dear life, but they're not letting go of it. Um, and that just brings me so much joy to look outside and see that. And because it flowers in such masses. You have masses of these black, dark chocolate cone-like seeds that are just covering the plants. 
And when all the gold finches are on it, it almost looks like it's still in bloom because you get in that golden color that's still on there. But um, I planted my large patch of goldstrom um, right in front of my Amsonia hubrichtii, so my, my Arkansas blue star. And it's kind of interesting because the blue star will bloom and do its thing. It gives me the blue. And then when it goes out of bloom and it's just green, that's when the, the Rudbeckia, the, the black eyed Susans are coming into bloom. So then I've got more bloom. And then as the Amsonia starts to turn that bright yellow color in the fall, it's the perfect backdrop for those black seed pods of the Goldstrom Black-Eyed Susan. So you can actually see them showing up behind it. And I think that's what the picture I'm going to put on the uh, show notes is. So perfect plant combination, I will say. I really like Amsonia Hubrick DI with Goldstrom Black-Eyed Susan. And uh, do yourself a favor, plant it. It'll make you happy and the goldfinch is happy too. <laughs>